The genome of an organism is inscribed in its DNA, or in the case of some viruses, RNA. Now the portion of the genome that codes for a protein, or an RNA, is called a gene. And those genes that code for proteins are composed of trinucleotide units called codons, each coding for a single amino acid. So in other words, each set of three bases is a codon. So let's take one gene in the genome. So I'll draw a little chromosome here. Here's the gene. This gene gets transcribed into the corresponding RNA polymer. And in prokaryotes, this RNA can function as the mRNA, or messenger RNA. But in eukaryotes, the transcript needs to be processed first before it produces a mature mRNA. This mRNA then gets translated by a ribosome into a chain of amino acids, otherwise known as a polypeptide. In this mRNA, each set of three nucleotides is a codon and corresponds to a particular amino acid. So the question is, how exactly do you get from a chain of nucleotides in RNA to a chain of amino acids in a protein? Well, the answer to that question is the genetic code. So here's the genetic code shown in table form. And as you can see, the table shows which amino acid each of the 64 codons. For example, let's take this codon here, CCG. You can see that it corresponds to proline. And if we take a look at another codon here, say CGA, you can see that it corresponds to arginine. The genetic code is the set of rules by which information coded within genetic material is translated into proteins by living cells. Biological decoding is accomplished by the ribosome, which links amino acids in an order specified by mRNA, using transfer RNA molecules that read the mRNA three nucleotides at a time using their anti-codon loop, and then carry the corresponding amino acid to be added to this growing polypeptide chain. The genetic code is highly similar among all organisms, and because the vast majority of genes are encoded with exactly the same code, this particular code is often referred to as the standard genetic code, though there have been some variant codes proposed. With four different bases and possible combinations of three bases at a time, there are four to the third or 64 different codon combinations possible with a triplet codon of three nucleotides. So all 64 codons are assigned to either an amino acid or a stop signal. If, for example, an mRNA sequence, say, we'll just make one up here, and we take this mRNA sequence and the reading frame starts with the first U because it's by convention read five prime to three prime. There are three codons, namely UCA, GCA, CGG, and CAG, each of which specifies one amino acid. Therefore, this 12 base RNA sequence will be translated into an amino acid sequence that is four amino acids long. Why don't you go ahead and take a second and see if you can decode this particular strand of RNA. If you came up with serine, alanine, arginine, and glutamine, then you'd be correct. Now a codon is defined by the initial nucleotide from which translation starts. For example, let's take our mRNA sequence. If read from the first position, it contains the codons UCA, GCA, CGG, and CAG. If read from the second position, however, you get a totally different combination of codons. You get CAG, CAC, and GGC. And if read from the third position, you get yet a different set of codons. So every sequence can thus be read in three different reading frames, each of which produces a different amino acid sequence. And with double-stranded DNA, there are six possible reading frames, three in the forward orientation on one strand and three reverse on the opposite strand. So to avoid any confusion, the actual frame in which a protein sequence is translated is defined by a start codon, which is usually the AUG codon in the mRNA sequence, which you can see here codes for methionine. Translation starts with a chain initiation codon or start codon, typically AUG, which codes for methionine. There are alternative start codons depending on the organism. Now, unlike stop codons, the start codon alone is not sufficient to begin the process of translation. Nearby sequences, such as the Schindel-Garnot sequence in bacteria, as well as initiation factors, are also required to start translation. 
Now the three stop codons are UAA, UAG, and UGA. Stop codons are also known as termination or nonsense codons. They signal the release of the nascent polypeptide from the ribosome because there's no corresponding tRNA that has anticodons complementary to these stop signals. And so a release factor binds to the ribosome instead. An important concept that comes up with regards to the genetic code is the idea that it is redundant but not ambiguous. And just FYI, another way to refer to redundancy is with the word degeneracy. So you might see that sometimes. So what exactly does this mean? Well, for example, although codons CUC and CUA both specify for leucine, this is the example of redundancy, neither of them specifies any other amino acid. This is where the code is not ambiguous. A practical consequence of redundancy is that some errors in the genetic code cause only a silent mutation or an error that would not affect the ultimate coding of the protein because the overall hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity is maintained by equivalent substitutions of amino acids. For example, a codon of say NAN, where N stands for any nucleotide, tends to encode average size hydrophilic residues, whereas NUN tends to code for those amino acids that are hydrophobic. And NCN generally yields amino acid residues that are small in size and moderate in hydrophobicity. And these tendencies may actually result from the shared ancestry of the aminoacyl tRNA synthetases related to these codons.